Coleman, and we're talking Main Street and the small business lenders who make it grow. Here's today's top story. A couple of weeks ago, we had an event in Washington, D.C. Assistant to the Secretary for Rural Development, Ann Hazlitt, was the keynote speaker at the World's Lender Roundtable. She talked about three things. This is USDA BNI Lending, which is a great program for rural America's main streets. She talked about infrastructure, partnership, innovation. Take a listen. Um, let me start by sharing that I have a long, deep appreciation um, for what you in the rural lending community do from my time working in agriculture on Capitol Hill as well as my time in private law practice and in public service um, in my home state of Indiana. I think about uh, during the time that I was in state government, it was really during the boom of the ethanol uh, sector for the Midwest, and I think about the investments that the lending community helped to make in the biofuels industry. Um, in addition to biofuels, we think about community, important community infrastructure, whether it's a new health clinic or um, ed, an expansion of a local community college. You're simply a key partner in facilitating prosperity in rural communities. Um, as community banks, I think about how um, the lending sector really doesn't just invest in transactions in these places, but instead you're investing your resources in transformation of these communities, and I respect you for that. Um, I share your commitment to the quality of life and economic opportunity in these places, um, and I truly, truly value the partnership um, that we have built with you over many years and many projects uh, to benefit rural America. At USDA Rural Development, there's a long-standing motto that we are committed to the future of rural communities with the resources that we have, whether it's in utilities, telecommunications, housing, uh, community facilities, business development, and we stand ready to work um, with you and to make a difference in the community in which you work. And as we look out on the horizon together, there are very real opportunities and very real challenges um, for rural America to address. And the opportunities, we think about the plentiful natural resources in these places. We think about the entrepreneurial spirit that is in so many communities. On the challenge side, we think about things like workforce development and the opioid epidemic that is currently ravaging so many of these places. Um, Bill did a great job of um, highlighting some of the more challenging statistics when we think about rural America right now. 85% of the poorest counties in the country are in rural places. And I think about some of these communities, and while many of the rural places in our country have some of the most historic and charming uh, community settings, when we peel back and think about the need for robust modern infrastructure as a way of connecting the people that live there to the modern world, many of these towns simply lack um, those, <clears throat> lack those assets. The young people that live there often leave um, when it's time to begin their career, not because they want to, but because there are not opportunities for them to stay in the place in which they grew up and to make a quality of living. And lastly, with these challenges, the rural communities um, remain vulnerable to sudden downturns, whether it's hurricanes, the likes, the disasters, the likes of the hurricanes that we've seen this year, or something uh, not weather related, but instead in the economy, like a sudden plant closing. So to maximize the impact of our resources at USDA Rural Development, particularly in the budget, challenging budget times in which we are in, Secretary Purdue has really focused our efforts at RD on one simple goal, and that is to facilitate rural prosperity and economic development. Last week, Lance Sexton, Coleman webinar instructor extraordinaire, gave a great presentation on the new rules for business acquisition loans, and I put in this slide sort of as a trick question. I'm not advocating, i got to be very clear, I'm not advocating SBA 7A lenders can do 100% commercial real estate financing. All I'm saying is it's not in the SOP. SBA allows it as long as it's fully collateralized, there's cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. Listen to this exchange. The new SOP 5010-5J prohibits 100% SBA 7A commercial real estate financing. Bob, you're kind of tricky. You're, you're getting kind of tricky here, Bob, and I'm not going to make a comment until I see the answers. Well, I, I, what's wrong with trick questions? <laughs> I think we gave it away. True or false? Well, it false. does not. It does not prohibit 100% CRE financing. If you have an existing balance business with a strong balance sheet, a strong net worth, you're going to look at the performa net or performa balance sheet 
with a new acquisition, and if they still meet the equity, equity requirements, they're fine. I, I offer up the example, I had a business that's been around for 25 years, uh, strong ownership, good cash flow, had a half million dollar net worth, they wanted to buy a new $250,000 warehouse, the blended equity position was like 44%. I financed 100% of that. And as long as you cover the collateral, which you can cover through the business financial statement, you can do it. So I, I wouldn't recommend it, but do not, for you 33%, you've heard out there that, hey, we can't do 100% commercial real estate financing. You can, especially go back to your uh, dentist um, and they have strong equity in the personal residence and they don't have a lot of cash, that makes a perfect time to take the additional residence. We can go 100% and go from there. A new feature of the Comb Report is we're going to be grading franchises. So started the first one with Subway. Several years ago, I would have given them an A. They are still very strong performing loans based on past uh, charge-off and delinquency performances. The problem is there's a lot of rumblings out there. Take a listen to what Lance Sexton and I said about Subway in their C plus grade. Over uh, last week is that we're going to start assigning grades to franchises and make life simple. And I talked about Subway. And this is an, ins an instance of where this isn't on any financial statement. We just picked this up and uh, the franchisees are not happy. They're not very happy that somebody's going to go back to the 495 foot long special. They're saying they can't make money on that. Uh, There's almost a thousand stores were closed last year. Uh, sales are down a tick, not bad. And um, if you look at the default rates, Subway ranks right up there. But understand there are off balance sheet metrics that may that will impact Subway's performance in the future. Well, I wanted to, and, and again, I encourage everybody, if you don't have a copy of the Coleman Franchise Report, you should get one. Uh, but a Subway franchise, those people who've been in it for 10 years, I don't look at them and say, ooh, shame on you. But when they had the problem with that spokesperson, Jared Fogel, those people who opened one after that, Subway, there are 50 different places you can get a sub sandwich. So if you have some negative publicity, uh, you might want to look at a different option. Slotsky's also, Bob, I, I don't know what grade you'd give Slotsky's, but I'd love to see it. Uh, it's struggle. Yeah. So I, I, the, the takeaway for this is if you look at the financials, if you look at our past statistics, everything looks fine. But and I'm still grading it above average, it's still an above average, but I, I would have graded this five years ago a solid A. And it's oh. slowly, slowly dropping. That's, that's my, my family, Bob, has been in the Western Sizzling restaurant business for 30 plus years. We recently closed it. It's paid for. We just got tired. We locked the door and rented the building out to somebody else. But the, the moral of the story there, that was an A plus restaurant back in the late 80s and not such a strong franchise anymore. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Every year, SBA Inspectors General issues a report to SBA management on what the Inspector General thinks are their serious management challenges. One of those challenges is how to regulate, that's probably the best word, loan service providers. And, they, and the Inspector General also wants to know how come we're not tracking loan brokers by referral sources and how they're doing. Take a listen. And it, it's an interesting read. And I bring this up just to say this is a factor the inspector general is always looking at sba still does not have a way to identify loan brokers they now assign numbers to loan service providers they haven't done loan brokers i didn't bring this up to talk about that what i brought it up is inspector general says and i agree with them that the higher incidence of fraud in the program come from loan brokers now Majority of loan brokers are legitimate and they're good, but there are some bad apples and that's what you should be aware of. And you should manage your loan brokers the way you do any other employee in your department. Well, and the 5010 5J talked about LSPs, lender service providers. And SBA historically has not done a very good job of, of monitoring loan brokers or LSPs. 
And there are a lot of wonderful LSPs, a lot of wonderful loan brokers that are doing things well and doing things right. Uh, so those of you who are out there doing it the right way, there's no no huge concern. But I think SBA needed to and had to get a, a way to monitor and keep an eye on these third parties. And look at that bottom line. It said there's a, approximately 15% of all SBA loans um, that resulted in default came from loan brokers. So let's, um, again, it's, it's nothing wrong with doing business this way. Just realize there's a higher level of prudent lending standards that you need to employ at your institution. Well, and the other thing I would want to point out is, is please understand that there's probably going to be a higher level of, there's going to be more, uh, LSP or I'm sorry, SOP changes down the road related to third parties that help you with your SBA lending effort. Thank you for joining us today and for supporting America's main streets, one entrepreneur at a time.